Welcome to Connect the Retail Experiences event hosted by Bailey Communications as part of the Start Me Up HK Festival 2020. My name is Jamilet Cano and I'm the founder of Louder. I'll be your MC for today. I'm so glad to have you here. This is the first time we have a virtual event for the Start Me Up HK. And we're so excited because even though we cannot have you face to face, we can have a more diverse community and attendees to be here with us. I know that we have over 2000 attendees registered for today of around 50 nations. So for that, I want you to be part of the event. We have so many interactive things. We have the live Q and A, polling and surveys coming up. So make sure that you're part of it. And I want to thank our sponsors and partners now because without their support, we cannot be here. Starting with the Start Me Up HK Festival Organizer, Invest Hong Kong. Our strategic partner, KPMG. We have our gold sponsors, Fitch and Ogilvy. And our renowned speakers and exhibitors. Thank you for being part. And without further ado, I want to welcome our founder and CEO of Bailey Communications, Mr. Stuart Bailey, to give us his welcoming remarks. Honorable Mr. Edward Yao, Secretary of Commerce and Economic Development of the Hong Kong SAR government. Mr. Stephen Phillips, Director General of Investment Promotion Invest Hong Kong. Distinguished members of the retail industry, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2020 Start Me Up HK Festival, the Connected Retail Experiences Programme driven by data, powered by people. We began preparing this conference program almost a year ago. The central theme of CRE is the technology that brings about a deeper connection between retailers and their customers. Customers who are demanding a seamless, personalized, omni-channel experience based on their individual preferences and past shopping behavior. An intelligent, yet authentic retail experience that can predict what they want perhaps before they know themselves. Retailers and retail brands have been paying lip service to this co concept for several years without taking any of the hard decisions needed to be able to achieve this holy grail of modern retailing. But the COVID-19 pandemic has brought into sharp focus the fact that digital transformation is no longer something to merely aspire to, something in a bright and distant future. No, it's something that needs to happen now and in order for them to survive and thrive. So how do retailers achieve this? Well, we know it isn't easy. Many large retailers have systems and processes that have been built up over many years. For these companies, it's difficult to innovate and think differently about how they can deliver new experiences. While smaller retail brands often labor under the misapprehension that innovative solutions are things which are too expensive or beyond their means. This is where the startup community comes into its own. Hong Kong is the home to some of the most forward thinking startups in the sector of retail technology. From companies offering experiential solutions like virtual and augmented reality, to startup companies at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and blockchain encryption, and to those with the latest mobile payment solutions and fast sustainable delivery supply chains. Over the next six hours, Connected Retail Experiences will deep dive into the problems of modern retail and look to find answers on how online and offline shopping will evolve where retail tech startups can add value to the process. We have 40 world-renowned speakers across two streams, as well as a virtual exhibition hall packed with the latest innovations for you to check out. So please sit forward, pay, pay close attention and enjoy the journey as we discover connected retail experiences. I would like to invite Mr. Stephen Phillips, Director General of Investment Promotion for Invest Hong Kong, to come and make some welcoming remarks. Well, Stuart, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And may I add my very warm welcome to the second day of the Start Me Up Hong Kong Virtual Festival, um, and in particular to this Connected Retail Experiences event. 
before we get into the meat of this afternoon's discussion, um, I just wanted to take a few moments to share with you um, how Invest Hong Kong can help you um, as a company to um, seize the opportunities in our great city. At Invest Hong Kong, our role is to help companies from all around the world to both set up and expand in Hong Kong. We have a dedicated team that helps both startups and scale-ups from all corners of the earth to come here to Hong Kong to capture exciting opportunities in the city, in the Greater Bay Area, in China, in ASEAN, and indeed even beyond that. Outside Hong Kong, we have colleagues in 33 cities all around the world, from Asia, China, um, India, the Middle East, Australasia, Canada, US, Mexico, and South America. So those colleagues are ready to support you in any way that they can. Um, in addition to our startup team here in Hong Kong, we also have colleagues who specialize in the retail and consumer product sector, and they can help you shape your strategy as you look to develop your business in Hong Kong. The support that we provide comes at every stage of market entry, from planning through setup, through the launch of your business in Hong Kong, and then in the longer term, how you expand into these vibrant markets across Asia. And what's more, the support that we provide comes at no cost to you. From Invest Hong Kong's point of view, from the government of Hong Kong's point of view, what we want to do is attract the very best companies from around the world to add to our economy and create jobs in the city. So please do get in touch with our teams. We're ready to help you in any way that we can. So please enjoy um, the session this afternoon. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Edward Yao, our Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, who will be sharing his thoughts with you. Thank you. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, even I can, cannot see all the sort of participants, uh, but well, I'm sure you can see me and you can see each other um, through the, through the uh, network. Well, I, I would congratulate uh, the organizer, uh, Stuart, and also uh, my department in West Hong Kong for uh, sort of uh, making this happen. I think no one would have thought that, well, we would need to meet on this basis six months ago. But, well, while there is a lot of uh, difficulties, I think this is typical Hong Kong, typical sort of a businessman sort of uh, uh, entrepreneurship that, well, we should be here to sort of overcome problems that we have. So. Um, I noticed that well today is one of the uh, one of the important sort of uh, uh, component of this Start Me Up Festival for, for this week long program and focusing on retail. I was tempted to talk about retail, but I well recognizing I'm no businessman nor uh, uh, and having any expertise. And I noticed that in the program there are a lot of very good speakers, so I would reserve the more sort of a sexy professional uh, part to the to the more competent one. But just to sort of a Ref refresh and reflect ourselves, well, at a time of um, this epidemic, how Hong Kong or the world is coping with it. I think, well, there are at least some, some pointers that well, we can gather at this point as we sort of look forward to quite a different commercial world in months, if not years to come. Now, I believe that, well, the, by every projection, I think um, this year or next year won't be a good year in terms of business and retail usually is in fact the, the hardest hit because of the reduction of traveling, reduction of tourism, and the sort of a, a, a sentiment uh, among consumer to buy less. But are we heading towards the end of the world or if the sky is falling? I don't think so. Well, the participation of this uh, uh, program itself uh, is a very good testimony uh, compared with uh, a full year of uh, last year, about 17,000 people joining this year. 14,000, not bad. And in, in fact, uh, many more people can also take advantage of uh, the e-connection. But I think every, every cloud has a, a silver lining. And even uh, when Hong Kong sort of uh, uh, faced COVID-19, I think there are still a few things that we can sort of uh, uh, learn from it and perhaps could be applied to the business well. I will summarize as four don'ts. The first one is don't stand still and move forward despite difficulties. This is obviously true because, well, in business world, uh, we, we, don't, we don't accept 
the uh, destiny uh, of, uh, of problems. And Hong Kong, typically, as an open and competitive market, we are here uh, drawing ideas. So I believe, well, particularly in the startup world, uh, how does it sort of connect with the traditional industry like retail? I think that's, that's also opened up a lot of opportunity. So I would believe, well, typical Hong Kong, we, while we sort of uh, uh, soldier on, we never uh, allow ourselves to have a complete lockdown. We adopt an attitude of sort of a, a suppress and lift where whoever circumstances allow. So the first one is don't let uh, the, the problem sort of uh, stand in our way. The second is don't cut corners, fight the train war head on. A lot of people uh, thought that, well, this is only a war against the epidemic. But actually from the Hong Kong experience, the last two years has been the toughest uh, among uh, within Hong Kong uh, for, for decades. We have seen the US-China trade tension. We have seen uh, the social unrest last year. We have seen the COVID-19 now. Uh, but we have been sort of taking a very uh, tough attitude that well, we want to fight and win over the COVID-19 uh, war against epidemic, but at the same time also fighting a war against the uh, very slippery economic sort of a recession. Now, so far, I think we have not given up. Now, when I say uh, we do not cut corners, I think, well, the whole world will need to face this new battle, which is a twin battle that without winning the first war against the epidemic, it will be hard to win over the second war, which is uh, simultaneously held against economic recession. So uh, in this process, it's important for government, business community, and the uh, and the society at large to work together to uh, respect the science, to respect the medical advice, and at the same time, adopt this new normal into our practices. Now, the third don't is uh, don't let a crisis go wasted. Uh, I, I believe uh, something being said by Winston Churchill along those lines. But yeah, in face of a crisis, I think, well, we, we can always turn it into opportunities. And I think this seminar today uh, speak for itself. And the last one is don't give up and don't check responsibility on others as we believe well the pandemic sees no boundaries. And actually uh, at, a, at a difficult time facing this uh, sort of a, uh, unknown uh, and also large-scale extensive uh, 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 pandemic, I think it calls for greater solidarity and also a lot of sharing of experiences, uh, respect for the science, uh, bring in different parties into the sort of a, uh, equation of solution. And I believe, well, Hong Kong uh, has, in fact, uh, uh, having the, the, the advantage where we are the marketing platform, we have here a ecosystem, as Stuart mentioned, that, well, different sort of professions uh, all join hands together. Uh, we are here to find solutions. So I hope, well, the Snap Me Up uh, week uh, is a good demonstration that, well, uh, as we move on, uh, let us sort of focus ourselves in finding opportunity, in sort of uh, uh, building up the collective strength, don't split force uh, uh, among ourselves and also sort of march on. So with this remarks, I congratulate uh, the, the function and also sort of look forward to hearing more from you. And I hope next year we'll scale, scale new height in terms of participation, in terms of business, and also in terms of winning over all the wars that we are heading on. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Yao and Stuart, obviously, and Mr. Phillips for the remarks. And before we start, I know you are very excited to start content. I'm just going to give you some housekeeping and rules for you to remember. I said before, we have many interactive elements for you to utilize. The live Q&A, if you want to send a question to a speaker or anybody in the panel, please do so through the live Q&A function. Don't miss it out. We also have social media. We all love to share. So make sure you tag the different hashtags that we have. CRE2020, start me up HK, hashtag at invest HK, connect to retail. And we also have the SMU HK Fest 20. So plenty of options for you to share content. Then apart from our main stage, we also have a lateral stream. This parallel stream has innovative retail tech companies that are gonna be sharing, answering questions about omni-channel trends and digital transformation. So make sure you go and ask your questions. We have the groundbreaking exhibition hall 
with all our exhibitors from different tiles of retail experiences. So make sure you visit the virtual hall. In there, also in the event platform, you will find the booths and they also have the solutions theater. If you need more information, go to the website connect, connectedretail.hk. You'll find the full agenda and more information of all the exhibitors. If you're feeling like a coffee break, you need a little bit of time, you want to meet face-to-face -face virtually with some of the counterparts, go to the virtual coffee break sponsored by Coffee Academics. Make sure you make sure make use of it. What else do we have? If you have any questions, we also have in our events platform, the chat box. So send it to our success team. Any questions, they make sure to get back to you. And without further ado, we are going to start the content from Connected Retail Experiences Festival 2020, where we're going to define what's next and learn how to survive and thrive. For our, for our first dial in, we're going to be joined by someone in Cindy down under. He is going to be sharing his insights into the retail trends and future with a perspective on leadership and disruption in the market. He has a lot of experience in retail wholesale operation, buying information tech system, supply chain and HR management. Please welcome, as I said from down under, Mr. Bernie Brooks, Chairman of Fantastic Australia, Chairman of Dodds Australia, ex CEO of Mayor Australia, and ex CEO at Con South Africa. Hello, Mr. Bernie. How are you there in Sydney? Hello, how are you? So nice to see you. Is it very shiny over there? Uh, it's absolutely a beautiful day. Sun shining, a nice 20, 23 degrees and uh, absolutely beautiful. So we are very, very glad to see you here and looking forward for your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. So I'm not sure whether you can just let me share a screen for a moment. I think the host needs to enable me to share a screen if they could. Thank you. Okay, hopefully that's all looking good and thanks indeed for the opportunity. I plan to talk today a little bit about some of the retail trends, both pre and post the COVID, imp uh, COVID situation and talk about some of the implications that occur um, in that regard. Firstly, uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing and talk about how, in fact, that's going to have significant implications on um, the global retail economy and environment. And then thirdly, perhaps provide a couple of hints of some of the things that need to be done. Let me start with some of the trends that are occurring. I think when you talk about retail, you talk about a constant state of flux these days, an enormous amount of disruption that's occurring in commerce. But this is not unusual, whether it's COVID or whether it's the arrival of the World Wide Web. If you remember as retail started, whether it be the stall um, sitting in Turkey right the way through to the shopkeeper in London or in, in Australia, it started really as a customer service based environment where you went and visited and they knew a lot about the local environment, the people, and more importantly, they knew a lot about their customers as they came into the store. And then we moved to the 50s and 60s, which in the States, Australia, Europe, and Asia, we saw the implications of self-service retailing where people could browse and choose effectively what they wanted and immediately took away that personalized aspect of the service, but with it caught an enormous amount of changes in the way in which retail is managed. And then probably one of the most underestimated changes in retail was certainly the disruption that occurred in e-commerce due to the arrival of scanning and barcodes and scanning suddenly gave us a poultice of information a plethora of data and customer information, particularly when it was linked with loyalty cards, and therefore enabled the retailers to have a lot more power and ability to be able to understand their consumer. 
And then from that, the arrival of the World Wide Web, and with that, all the implications and disruption associated with it. Online shopping, omni-channel, the movement to social media forms, and we saw perhaps up until COVID-19, the most significant disruption we've seen in the last 50 years in retail. And not only did it impact retail, it impacted businesses, whether it be, think of the changes that occurred in the delivery of news, uh, the online gaming and gambling, the medical area, Airbnb as an example. It didn't matter what commerce area you were in, it was going to have a significant disruption as people learnt more about the use of online. And hasn't it been a significant and faster change with the implications of COVID? The COVID-19 disruption, where suddenly cash is king, distancing, if you like, is here to say, screens and social distancing and disinfecting and protecting is going to be the new norm. I'm going to talk about COVID-19 a little today, but looking at the quality of the speakers you have later today, I'm going to touch on it, but I'm not going to make it the main topic, but I am going to talk about some of the general implications of COVID-19. Ideally, though, we're seeing such a significant change in the way in which space is managed, a significant change in the way in which we serve our customer. We're seeing retailers respond by firstly, simplification of their range. I think premiumization is going to be in trouble as, as people realize they have to save a penny for the following day. What will happen if there's a second wave? What will happen in the current retail environment? And so people are going to be loath to spend and low, and more importantly, they're gonna to look to save rather than spend on premium and luxury items. We're gonna see the rise even further of private label as retailers look for ways in which to get into that very tough consumer dollar that's available. And we're gonna see over 170 countries enter into recession throughout the world. And added to that, what I call a tribal encampment, new legislations from various countries where they're going to endeavor to close down their borders and stop a lot of uh, imported products or find alternative supply chain means. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. The retailers are facing an enormous amount of challenge. Firstly and foremost, this was a global healthcare crisis. And we can all forget that when we think of retail. Food and pharmacy or medical areas adopted with an enormous amount of speed and pride. They did a great job. But ultimately the winners of this are going to be the Amazons, the Alibabas, the JD.com, the Flipkart, those are going to be the winners from this environment. We've seen the change where customers now are refocusing on basic necessities, hygiene, and we've got a very different agenda. Their spending is even harder to get. The changes that are occurring in currencies at the moment mean that international purchasing power is going to be fluctuating quite significantly. And no longer are we happy with one method by which we can supply chain, we can find product. What we want is a multitude of options in supply chain. So if a country is cut off with a pandemic or cut off because of government legislation or this tribal encampment that's occurring where people wanna buy locally, we're seeing that that's gonna have an impact on how products go to market. The arrival of international competitors into a lot of state markets such as Australia, the arrival of the H&Ms, um, numerous countries, the Muji, the Uniglos, all of them have arrived at a rapid rate and that will obviously, obviously subdue as businesses cocoon back into what they know best, their local environment and the ability to make profit from that local environment. Whether it be through lockdown, coping in lockdown, we saw people suddenly learn to cope in lockdown, how they communicate, what they buy, what they do, the hobbies that they have. Then we saw people move to things such as house and garden craft. And now we're seeing what I would call a temporary treat or a revenge spending as people became more free and easy in the way in which they move around. So what are some of the implications of this change, not only with the arrival of the World Wide Web and scanning, but more importantly, what's happening now with the disruption associated with COVID-19? We already know that a large number of decisions are being made today with online. This was a table before COVID-19. Can you imagine today that those 50, 60, 70s and 80 percent would now be up at 90, 95 percent where people have learned to check the price of a TV or electronic item, to check the price of a music download, to check the price of a health product all online to be able to get the cheapest price. Even my 90 year old mother and father are now looking online 
where before they wouldn't even open a computer. The world has changed quite dramatically. The, ex the pandemic accelerated the speed of change, but it didn't change the direction. It accelerated the speed of change, but it didn't, take, didn't change the direction. In 10 weeks, the structural change that we thought would take place in retail that would take three to five years has happened quickly. And that has significant implications for such things as the way in which we spend our capital, how we allocate resources and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So growth will change with so much disruption across the world. Traditional retail growth of bricks and mortar is gone. In fact, if anything, it could be as much as minus three to minus 5%. The growth in e-commerce will continue to thrive, obviously, no matter what country you're in, the growth in social will continue to climb. But unfortunately, whether it be bricks and mortar, or retail growth, and even the standard CPI growth associated with such things as wage rises will change as well. There's no tailwinds for retailers going forward. So what are some of those things that are impacting the retail environment? And on each of these slides, not only have I talked about what's implicating, but I'm talking also about some of the globalized, the impacts that they have. So let's talk firstly about the trends, then talk a little bit about what it is you should be doing as individuals and leaders, what you should be doing as startup companies, and what you should be doing as a company general to be able to thrive. And I've listed some really good examples on each slide of some of the best practice we're seeing. Globalization was happening at a rapid rate. We saw Costco move into many more countries, H&M expand, Primark go into the US. We saw companies such as Inditex under different names move to countries and horizons they weren't in. Cotton On moved to South Africa and different countries. There's no doubt that globalization will continue to thrive because even during COVID-19, they have deep pockets, good long-term shareholders and the ability to invest. And that could be at the loss of many people that don't have alternative markets. If you're trading today in a heavy COVID in impacted environment and you're trading in a non-impacted environment such as New Zealand, you can see the dramatic difference that's occurring. And therein lies the benefit of having a diversification strategy from a globalization point of view. But the big, unfortunately, will get bigger and the small will get smaller. However, there's a fantastic market for localization, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. We're also gonna to continue to see an acceleration of the price and value focus. The world has fallen in love with the lowest price discounter. The super, super centers at Walmart, the Aldis, the online shopping options, the bargain basements, the clearance houses, the right the way through to some of the coupons that are available. And we're seeing the move now to value become very important. As people have managed to thrive through lockdowns with limited income and therefore limited expenditure, particularly on discretionary product, we're going to see them very conscious of what it is they spend their money on. Whether it be the traditional beauty regime, whether it be the money you spent on your Louis Vuitton bag, there's no doubt people are going to be looking more and more for value and price focus. Once we get through this current, what I would call revenge spending, it's going to be a very different retail world. And whether it be the lowest price or the better value or the opportunity to move towards value for money offerings, we're going to see a significant change occur. And the winners here will be the Walmarts and the Asdas and the Pep and the Aldi as an example. We're also seeing a continued need for customization. Although somewhat thwarted during the environment that we would call um, a retail environment under COVID, there's no doubt that the future or the go forward is very much about being able to customize and personalize the product. The American Girl dolls, being able to have a Christmas special delivery with your name on it, to have your name put on a can of Coca-Cola, to have your name put on a, a Chanel perfume. And that customization that I've got something that no one else has, is seen to be a real future in retail, regardless of what's currently happening under COVID-19. But we've also seen the mobile disruption accelerate at a rapid rate. People have moved from the desktop computer, bypassing such things as laptop, and in some cases bypassing iPads, to move straight to their mobile phone as the means for communication and their livelihood in the technology world. And companies such as Apple and Saks, companies such as Walgreens, Coca-Cola, have all worked particularly well. Look at the interruption that's occurred with Uber, as an example, and clicks in South Africa. 
in boots in the UK. The great job they've done being able to take advantage of this mobile disruption. It really means you probably start with your development of a mobile application and then work back to other applications going forward. Success going forward is also going to be about how you manage artificial intelligence, how you manage data utilization and build loyalty. Airlines throughout the world are struggling and will continue to struggle. Their livelihood, if you like, the thing that they can cling to while everyone else is drowning is going to be their ability to cling to such things as their loyal customers who may be a gold customer or a silver customer or emerald customer and work upon it. Estee Lauder, Zappos, many, many companies will need to use the same. And the use of artificial intelligence in chatbots online, right the way through to AI that's used for in data mining environments will also be an important part of that uh, future. I think the other significant change is going to be that people are going to make even more, more a difference. I think there's no doubt that if I've been looked after as an employee, a valued employee through the COVID-19, I'm going to be a lot more loyal to that company. If you've managed to pay me, look after me, support me, provide me with medical support, if you've been able to motivate me, provide me with support above and beyond what I thought I would receive during a difficult time, you've got me for life. However, if you've treated me poorly, if you haven't looked after me, I'm going to be out looking for a job. We we'll see companies such as PetSmart in the US, Woolworths in South Africa, Nordstrom's in the, U in the US, Apple around the world, that if you look after those people during this tough time, they're going to look after you. The people difference is going to become even, even more prevalent. Although a lot of innovation is one of the first things that stopped during a difficult time, we've got to cut costs. Where are we going to cut costs? We're going to take away the newness. We're going to take away the innovation. We're going to concentrate on our core. They're important parts during the eight or 10 weeks of a lockdown. But as things start to get back to a normal, accelerating the newness, the uniqueness, and the innovation is also going to be important. We look at the work that's been done by Incredible Connection in South Africa, Hamleys, Avon, Fnac through Europe. It's great examples of the product, the innovation, the technology that's occurring. And people are going to be looking for newness as they do come out to bricks and mortar. They're going to be looking to new initiatives as they go online. And so effectively, you've got to be part of that as the others continue to cocoon and to work and tribal and camp, if you like, back in their own environment. An opportunity for startups, I think, is enormous. The other part that becomes quite interesting is as malls suffer significantly from what's going on in the world at the moment, you've got to make sure that if you do have a store, that it's got imagination, that it uses visualisation and the ability to see the product, see the utility of the product and see it quickly is really important. And we quite often see many, many retailers reduce their visual merchandising budget, reduce their ability to design websites, reduce the way in which they assign funds to such things as social media, all thinking that this is part of the cost cutting environment. It's a time to actually stand out, to be recognised first and to be imaginative and to be visual in what it is you actually undertake. It's also important, and I think we've learned a lot from COVID-19, of the importance of the retail environment and their role in the community. The food retailers throughout the world had a tough job to deliver product, to keep product available, in some cases to home deliver product. And suddenly the realization has come that it's about the community that you serve. I think there'll be increasing pressure for listed retailers and unlisted retailers to include environmental, social, and government's factors in such things as the valuation of their, of their country, of their company. Because what we've seen is businesses stand out from the crowd in their ability to deliver. We saw Louis Vuitton go to produce hand sanitizer. We saw companies pivoting into areas that they'd never pivoted to before. And that's worked very, very well. The opportunity to be part of the community is ever, was always present and accelerating as a need. I'd now put to you that it's even more important are going forward. There's no doubt too that we're going to see significant change occur in the way in which people look at other, other parts of their business. Particularly in, just bear with me one sec, particularly, 
Oh, the slide's not working. Thank you. Particularly in regard to the way in which you select a channel. Where should you invest your money going forward? Bricks and mortar, social media, other forms, artificial intelligence, into your online website, into the technology associated and the robotics associated with such things as your supply chain. The customer has now learned, even people that were not online as well, previously, some 40% of people that bought products around the world through the COVID-19 situation were first users of online sites. Goodness, what an enormous opportunity is to convert them and bring them along and take advantage of that. But the customer today is somewhat agnostic to the channels they have. Online, in-store, social media, it doesn't matter. They want a competitive offer to be entertained through any of those means. No longer is it bricks and mortar as the important foundation going forward. What we'll forget as we move further out of a COVID-19 environment is the need for theatre and fun. The guy or girl standing outside the Abercrombie and Finch store, the entertainment that occurs every week at Selfridge, Selfridges, the higher echelon entertainment that occurs at areas such as Harrods, the toy shop at Hamleys, how do you build that video content? How do you build into um, your website, your social media, and equally your bricks and mortar stores, that theatre and that fun? The other important thing that we've learnt, and I think will accelerate now, is the important importance that are placed upon education. No longer than can a supermarket sell a particularly odd variety of lettuce or new fruit and vegetable or how do you use a pasta, or what is the particular cooking associated with this um, Williams and Sonoma product? Or how do I use various Sephora products on makeup? And there's some of the great examples. People want to be educated. We saw the move back to home cooking during COVID-19, and we saw the rise in such things as online recipes, people trying new product, cooking up a storm. And we've seen, obviously, over the last few years, the rise of the master chef and the various um, TV shows that have, that have continued to put in front of us new opportunities in the way things are used. Customers no longer will want to buy a product unless they know how to use it and they need to be able to quickly get access to the education. But with that comes an enormous amount of what you would call hashtag activism. We saw, if you like, the flattening of the retail curve and a big flattening it was. We then saw the retailers fighting to survive and now we're looking at the future and with that, suddenly, the rise and rise of social media forms of what I call hashtag activism. One of the pictures there is a picture of a South African H&M store. Two days after, they had printed a T-shirt in their store that was seen to be against the local practice. And if you would like, let's call it quite um, unfair to the local community. That was the response all through hashtag activism. Bricks and mortar space is going to be quite different going forward. And we will see such things as credit risk associated with the degree of social media comments. We're going to see total shareholder return, perhaps measured not only by the social media front, particularly in things such as Facebook, et cetera, but the world's changed. And these were things that retailers, boards of retailers and listed companies didn't have to take into account. Perhaps the most significant change is going to be in the space disruption that's occurring right now. We are going to see the continued deterioration of value for shopping centres owners and REITs throughout the world. Although we're seeing a bit of what I call revenge spending at the moment, and we see people get back to restaurants and people being able to purchase, depending on the different country and their COVID-19 restrictions, and although people still like the physicality of shopping, this will be the moment of truth for many brands. There isn't a day go by in any of the retail magazines where we're seeing the announcement of a reduction in bricks and mortar store. Most retailers are realizing that more is not good, that less is best. Less penetration into major shopping centers and the B and C grade malls will suffer quite dramatically. And also we're seeing a greater demand from shareholders. We saw that early on before COVID-19, we're seeing it now. What is the plan? What is the strategy going forward? And more importantly, 
how do I preserve my investment? And what are you doing as a management to support the local community and assist in what is a very tough COVID-19 environment? We're going to see and are seeing a number of fragile balance sheets. Each day in Australia, in most countries throughout the world, we're seeing a list occurring of those people moving into administration, chapter nine, voluntary administration, restructuring balance sheets, as this was not predicted by a lot of cash flow forecasts. And so suddenly, when you thought the bottom was there, there's a much lower bottom in balance sheet. And people are gonna to want to keep more money on their balance sheet because cash is going to be king going forward. If there is a second wave or a third wave, or perhaps thinking of when the next pandemic may well be. Very hard to predict the future, but there's no doubt it's going to be an incredibly difficult time. And we're going to continue to see a combination of what I call the grey haired experienced people that have been around for years and have gone through the tough times, combined with techno tots. There is no solution going forward about what the ideal makeup of a company would be. But Start Me Up and techno tots and people that are equipped with those skills are going to combine with some of the experienced retailers to add historical perspectives to future perspectives to deliver a good way forward for many companies. The first time we've seen many people enter this online space and this omnichannel space, and as I said, there was over 40% of new users during COVID, an opportunity, but perhaps also a risk to bricks and mortar. And despite significant government subsidies that we saw, whether it be in retail businesses or in hospitality businesses or generally for unemployment support, and it doesn't matter what degree it was in what country, it's fair to say that you were either in a sweet spot, the sweet spots being you were selling the right product, or you were in an unsweet spot, such as beauty, cosmetics, an unsweet spot might be travel, uh, travel goods as an example. But if you happen to be selling jigsaw puzzles and things for the home, you were in quite a sweet spot. So we saw the tipping point occurring in many, many businesses. We saw it's becoming obvious that in three months, we have a structural change in the retail sector. And what would have been, if you like, the normalizing of e-commerce, we're seeing it in norm, not only in supply chain, but in business as well. We've seen changes occur to the price, to the range, to the promotion that people will put things at. Let me now take the last five or six minutes of this presentation to talk you through what can be done and what should be done. And I'm gonna run through this pretty quickly, but leave you with some thoughts on how you manage through this difficult time. It's an enormous amount of change, but how do you respond as a retailer and as a leader or as a business? Well, firstly, there are strategic imperatives that are gonna stack up and be really important. And secondly, they're gonna be cultural imperatives. And if I look at the agenda today, a lot of these strategic imperatives are on the agenda and a lot of the cultural imperatives are on the agenda. Firstly, and it goes without saying, there is a need to invest in omnichannel, to significantly invest in omnichannel at all areas, particularly in the supply chain aspect. You have to build loyalty with your customers. Spend money to build a better loyalty program to know more about your customers, to respect to them, and more importantly, to respond to them as they want. You've got to rethink your routes to market. The pandemic has demonstrated that selling over the counter or through a self-service store means that you need to have more routes to market, more opportunities by which a customer under difficult circumstances can ascertain or buy your product. You have to understand the consumer. You have to now know that they're not necessarily going to spend on luxury when their fellow mates and friends are finding it very tough. You have to know what's hot right now, what it is they want to buy right now. Know that the jigsaw puzzle at home was an important part of the therapy that they needed to undertake. Know that hand sanitizers are going to become a thing of the future, not just a temporary win. Know what the consumer wants and respond to it. The hygiene and contactless alternative that people are talking about today is now the new norm. If we thought that debit cards, debit cards and um, PayPal and such things as being able to tap your phone were all, if you like, growing, they now become the norm. And people expect that when they go into a store, when they work in any way with a retailer, when they get something delivered at home, that you've thought about the hygiene and contactless alternatives that are required. I always said that supply chain is sexy. But let me tell you, it's going to become even more sexy going forward. Robotics, fast, efficient supply chain, 
was seen to be a future. Same day delivery, within two hour delivery, was seen to be a future. It's very quickly going to become an expectation of a consumer because your competitors are doing it. You have to rethink the supply chain opportunities and the routes to market. But you also have to be frugal on cost because you have to maintain a very different balance sheet and you've got to know where to spend your funds. And we are going to see a significant reduction in staff numbers across retail throughout the world as people look to reduce cost, understanding that the demand for product is going to deteriorate. And therefore, it's important that you think about how you're measuring things now. Footfalls into a supermarket or into a shopping centre was seen to be important. Are they important today as, say, a penetration rate or a basket size or a, a, a rate at which people leave your website? It's very different in the way in which things should be measured. You need to change your KPIs. But you still have to be a merchant. You still have to learn that on sale. It's, very, it's a lot harder under a website to get, independent, to get what I would call impulse sales. So how do I go about getting the ability to secure impulse sales? And think about partnerships that add value. One of the partnerships that's just occurred here is Defol, which is a very well-known um, antiseptic um, product that's sort of well-known and probably market leader in Australia, has linked with Uber to be able to make sure cars are clean. Who can you link with to be able to better take advantage of the current, current environment? Capital needs to be reviewed, supply chain needs to be reviewed, and online investment needs to be reviewed. But also customers are going to be continue to look for a consistent and disciplined approach to your brand. You can't flirt to suddenly be doing things because you think you may be able to make a dollar. They're going to trust a brand and they're going to look at the, what you accomplish by looking at your consistent and disciplined approach to product. And brands will stand through. Retailers in certain countries took some of the funds that were allocated in subsidies and sent them to their shareholders in the form of dividends. They'll be remembered going forward, just as many companies will be remembered for the job they did or didn't do during this environment. And you have to think about a whole of business strategy, not just a siloed function within each environment. That went out a long time ago. It's now disappeared under COVID-19. So finally, what are some of those cultural imperatives that you need to adopt? Well, firstly, from a cultural point of view, you have to innovate. Linking with startup companies, being able to integrate startups into your business, have the ability to have innovation labs, but you have to come up with the next best thing because your competitor is. And I think one of the things that the Japanese say is the allure of comfort can stifle the ability to innovate. The allure of comfort of understanding COVID-19 and what's gonna happen may stifle your investment in innovation when in fact it's much needed at the moment. But also the world's changed and you need to move a lot faster. The people that were able to pivot during COVID-19 and move to home deliveries, the pubs and hotels that were able to deliver meals, the restaurants that were able to deliver meals, they moved fast. They pivoted very, very fast. Does your business have the same ability to pivot? You also have to step up the ability to communicate. Employees have been and will continue to be distressed, uncertain about their future. And success is about communicating to those employees, keeping them fully up to date, but also communicating to your customers, your board and your management as well. We've also forgotten during this time to create some heroes. We've done a great job looking after a lot of the local health people that have done an excellent job looking and what you would call the frontline staff for helping us significantly. You've got to create some more heroes in your business now because people are going to be looking at them as role models going forward. You also have to understand exactly what the competition is doing. The competition has pivoted, they've changed their mind, they've changed their way forward. So therefore, how do you do the same? You've also got to think about what I can introduce that is what I call a fanatical simplicity. Doing things in the simplest possible fashion, particularly as your communication has changed with so many different people communicating direct to them, either through Zoom, through telephone, where previously you could take the time to explain it person to person. And make sure that that bad news travels faster than the good news. People, boards, management, and equally importantly, executives want to know what's gone wrong more than they want to know what's gone right. But we see constant situations where people look at that one aspect of it. You've also got to go back to your staff and encourage them to buy the product that they sell. 
shopping at home and local is going to become so important and have what I would call internal transparency of the way in which the business is performing because you forget quite often your staff will have a can-do attitude and want to assist you to be successful under these difficult times. Thank you for the opportunity today. My email is there, so if, uh, I probably won't get the chance on the 30 minutes is just about up to answer any questions, but I'm very happy to take any by email that can answer. I think it's a difficult time. We've seen a significant change occur, accelerated by what's happening with COVID-19. Hopefully I've been able to give you some hints and tips to thrive and survive during this difficult time. I look forward to the rest of the conference and learning myself. Thanks for the opportunity today.